Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Castlevania II Simon's Quest, originally released for Famicom and Nintendo Entertainment System, but it's later been ported to other systems as well. The footage you're seeing here was recorded from the PC version of the Castlevania Anniversary Collection. This is an action platformer by Konami and the direct sequel to the original Castlevania. It was originally released in 1987 for Famicom, with the following year being the North American release for NES, but the PAL region didn't get it until 1990. Upon its release, it was generally pretty well received, and it's come to be regarded as a classic along with the original Castlevania, of course. But at the same time, it was a noticeable departure from the gameplay style of the original Castlevania. It wasn't a linear action platformer, it was now non-linear, and it also had some light RPG elements going on. It was kind of similar to what The Legend of Zelda did with Zelda to The Adventure of Link, which took on a side-scrolling perspective and had some light RPG elements going on and things like that. But while that's more or less an experiment as far as The Legend of Zelda is concerned, in the case of Castlevania 2, you could actually look at it as the progenitor of the gameplay style that would come to define the Castlevania series after Symphony of the Night. The idea of a non-linear Castlevania game with some light RPG elements thrown in and a gameplay style that's a little more along the lines of, say, Metroid than anything else, aka what would come to be known as a Metroidvania. So how did Castlevania's first attempt at that gameplay style pan out? Did it actually end up being a success, or was it something else entirely? Well, before I start delving into this to try to answer that question, I want to reiterate, like I did in my original Castlevania review, that I am absolutely terrible at platformers, and that will likely be present in the footage here, so if that bothers you, then sorry, but I can't help it. And the other thing is that I have absolutely no nostalgia for this game whatsoever. I did not play this back in the day because I did not have an NES back in the day. I went straight from Atari 2600 directly to the Sega Genesis, and the first Castlevania game I actually played was Castlevania Bloodlines on the Genesis, or New Generation on the Mega Drive if you're from the PAL region. So with that bit of a disclaimer out of the way, let's go ahead and start delving right into this and see what exactly we're dealing with here and how well it still holds up. And as usual, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation, which you do have to keep in mind is still running on Famicom or NES hardware, which of course has very limited graphical and sound capabilities being an 8 bit system, but they've actually managed to make noticeable improvements over the original Castlevania. With more detailed sprite work as well as considerably better use of the color palettes, considering that the original game could often strain your eyes. And with the exception of maybe one or two screens, Castlevania 2 really doesn't do that at all. It's a much more aesthetically pleasing game than the original Castlevania. And there's even a day-night cycle where you will notice that the color palette shifts from something a lot more bright and vibrant into much more dark tones, mostly blues when you get to the night, and that actually ends up working out pretty well for the most part, although occasionally you will notice situations where due to the way the colors are used, you may not necessarily notice a particular platform. But like with the eye strain, that's a very rare thing as far as Castlevania 2's visuals are concerned, so they've generally done a very good job of just improving what they had over the original. What they've done considerably less work on is the sound design, where you have the 8-bit sound sound effects generally working out pretty well as far as those are concerned. I mean, there's only so much you can do with those anyway. And the soundtrack, like with the original game, is full of very catchy 8-bit tunes, one of which has become kind of a staple of the series, known as Bloody Tears, which plays whenever you're wandering around the wilderness during the day. And unfortunately, like with the vampire killer theme in the original Castlevania, that was really the only track that carried over into later entries of the series. I mean, when Smash Brothers Ultimate came around and included a bunch of remixes of Castlevania tracks, they did include the Monster Dance theme, which plays during the night when you're at the wilderness. But that one is more of a track that I think is universally hated, not necessarily because it's a bad track, in fact it's actually quite a good music track, but unfortunately of what circumstances it's actually in. And I think that's where I really do need to transition over into the gameplay and the story, because there's, again, just not that much to talk about as far as presentation goes. It's generally an improvement over the original game, but it's not a massive improvement because you're not exactly getting a massive generational shift or anything. So what exactly do you get as far as story and gameplay are concerned? Well, like with the original Castlevania, there's not a huge amount in the way of story. There is more setup in this than there was in the original game, however, it's not just a platformer. This one's set after the events of the original Castlevania, where Simon Belmont did defeat Dracula, but once he did so, he was stricken with a curse that requires him to find the five scattered body parts of Dracula himself and bring them to the ruins of Castle Dracula in order to defeat the vampire once and for 
overall. This journey will take him all across the lands, through various towns and all sorts of natural and otherworldly hazards, in order to find five different mansions that will each contain a part of Dracula, and in some cases, a boss that he will have to fight. Once he's collected all five parts of Dracula, as well as certain pieces of equipment, he can go to Castle Dracula and face the vampire himself, and once he's defeated Dracula, then it will give you one of three different endings depending on how quickly you beat the game. If you finish the game in seven in game days or less, then you get the good ending, and anything more than 14 in game days gets you the bad ending. Regardless of which ending you get, however, Dracula is defeated, and the only thing that really changes is the status of Simon himself. But considering there's no direct follow up to Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, the ultimate outcome of the story doesn't really matter all that much. But what really does matter is the gameplay, because there isn't really that much story in the game. You have the opening crawl, and then you have the end crawl, and that's it. So what exactly do you get as far as the gameplay of Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest is concerned? Well, it's very similar in a lot of ways to its predecessor. Of course, it is a side-scrolling platformer, you still have one button being bound to jump, one button being bound to attack, and of course, up and the attack button uses whatever sub-item you have equipped. The core gameplay loop is still going from area to area, hopping on platforms, dodging traps, and of course fighting monsters, but the particulars have been changed quite considerably. The first thing you'll notice is on the first screen of the game. It starts you off in a town, and you can find these towns scattered around the map that will allow you to either purchase things from various NPCs, or stop in a church in order to heal yourself, or just talk to the random NPCs wandering around those particular stages and see what information they can give you. Now I do have more to say about the information that these NPCs give you, but I'll be back to that in just a moment. The new purchasing mechanic also introduces an idea that you're going to have to get used to, which is the idea of hearts as currency. You see, in the original Castlevania, in case you haven't watched my review of that, the hearts were actually ammunition for your sub-weapons, whereas in this, they're primarily used as currency for buying various items that you'll need, things like improved whips that do more damage and have longer reach, as well as various items that you'll need to progress. The first of these that you'll encounter is the Holy Water, and you'll want to pick that up as early as possible because you can use it for two primary things, the first of which is to just throw and destroy various blocks that will allow you to progress past certain areas, and the second is that you can just throw it on the ground to see if the platform that you're running on is actually a platform or if it's just a false block. The false blocks in this can be incredibly annoying when you run across them, so you'll want to have the holy water as early as possible, and since it doesn't cost any hearts to throw it out, unlike in the original Castlevania, then you can just keep throwing it out as many times as you need to. And while its use as a sub-weapon is pretty much limited to the first few screens that you go through, your use of it as a utility item is going to be invaluable throughout the rest of the game. There are three other main utility items you'll have throughout the course of the game. Those are garlic, which is just extremely situational, as well as laurels, which give you about 10 seconds of invulnerability and can be pretty useful, and the oak stakes, which you require in order to break the spheres that hold Dracula's various parts in the mansions that they're housed in. And while you can carry multiple cloves of garlic and multiple laurels at once, and this can capacity is actually expanded once you get the silk bag later on, you can only carry one oak stake at a time, and the only place you can get oak stakes is in the mansions themselves. There's a particular vendor that you'll find somewhere in the mansion, and you can buy an oak stake from them that you can use to shatter the sphere later on. Also, a word of advice there, don't try to use that as a sub-weapon, because even though it acts like a sub-weapon, it actually doesn't do any damage to anything except the spheres. So, if you try to throw it at an enemy, it just passes right through them harmlessly. Aside from all the usable items are various items that you can equip, and most of these are actually the various parts of Dracula themselves. The one that you'll probably be using the most is Dracula's rib, which if you have it equipped, when you're standing still, you'll actually hold it up as a shield and it will reflect projectiles. 
Aside from that, the only other two parts that actually have any real benefit to you are Dracula's Nail, which causes your whip to actually be able to break blocks that are ordinarily only able to break with holy water, as well as Dracula's Eye, which allows you to see what is hidden behind false blocks. The other two parts do have their uses, but they're extremely situational, and that's something that you'll come to find as a particularly nasty problem with this game. Because among the equipable items, you have, of course, all five parts of Dracula, as well as a crystal, which starts out as a white crystal that you can buy in the first town, and I highly recommend you do so, by the way. And then, of course, the blue crystal, which you get by trading the white crystal for it, and eventually a red crystal that you get by trading the blue crystal for it. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, why is DW explaining all of this through instead of just leaving it kind of vague so that people who haven't played the game can have that not spoiled for them? Well, to put it quite simply, it's because the game does an absolutely terrible job of conveying any information about how to progress to the player. Oh, you get some very vague hints from some of the villagers, but not very many of them say anything even remotely useful. I mean, one of them tells you that the sacred flame is in the middle of a forest, and it's not. It's actually hidden underneath a block somewhere that you have to go find and destroy with holy water. Another one tells you that you need to hit a cliff with your head in order to make a hole, but you never need to do any of that. The only way you can actually make blocks disappear is by hitting them with holy water or the powered up whip. And those are just two examples from the myriad NPCs you'll run across that will all give you vague information at absolute best and often outright lies at worst. And while this is partly due to the fact that a lot of the information that the NPCs say in the original Japanese is actually not necessarily correct, in a lot of cases it's actually also due to mistranslations. I mean, you'll also end up with numerous spelling errors all over the game, which range from inconsequential but mildly annoying problems all the way up to things that actually do impede your progress. For example, one of them tells you to go to a certain town when the actual town name in the original Japanese is a different town in the game entirely. And then when you pick up certain parts of Dracula, it will not tell you that you possess them, it will actually tell you that you possess them. Now, of course, the spelling and translation errors are one thing, but the information that you're getting being mostly false also ends up making the game a lot more irritating than it really needs to be, because there are numerous instances where you have to do something ridiculously specific with a very specific item in order to be able to progress at all. To give you a prime example, in order to get to one of the mansions in order to get one of the parts, you need to use the blue crystal to actually go beneath a lake. Well, how do you do that? If you go up to that lake and you decide to jump into it, even if you have the blue crystal equipped, you just die instantly because you always die instantly whenever you drop into water. Well, what you actually have to do is equip the blue crystal, then stand at the edge of the lake and crouch for several seconds before the screen slowly goes down and reveals a hidden path that you can actually go to now. Another one that's a bit more infamous is that you need to go to one particular screen, equip the red crystal, and then crouch on the very far edge of the screen in order for a whirlwind to come from the other side of the screen, pick you up, and take you directly to one of the mansions. They're the kind of thing that you couldn't possibly know without either consulting a walkthrough or just a ludicrous amount of trial and error. Now, in the case of the lake, the game actually does give you a hint for that that's actually relatively explicit, but even then, it's still a fairly vague way of saying what you need to do, and you still have to figure out exactly where you need to do it. But the bit about the red crystal only tells you to wait for a soul with a red crystal on Deborah Cliff. Okay, what's Deborah Cliff? What do you mean by a wait? Do I just stand there and just wait for something, or do I have to do something? What exactly do I need to do for this soul to appear? What is this soul? Is it an enemy? Is it What exactly is going to happen? That's the kind of problem you get when the game doesn't give you the proper information to proceed. To make matters worse, you'll get numerous references to specific locations that mean absolutely nothing to you because they're never actually shown anywhere in the game. So for example, one of the first things that you'll encounter is an NPC that tells you that you have a friend in a specific town named Aldra and you need to go see him. And you're like, okay, cool. What's Aldra? Where is that? How do I get there? 
No idea, because the game doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you when you enter a town what that town is. Nowhere on the town screen does it ever say what the town is. You just have to guess. And once again, that makes the game considerably more frustrating than it really needs to be, especially when you consider that outside of just having no idea what you're supposed to do half the time, the game's actually really not that difficult. Unlike the original Castlevania, which used BS difficulty to make itself artificially difficult and thus artificially lengthen the game in true arcade game principles, this one is really actually quite easy if you know what you're supposed to do. Unless you just never upgrade your whip to do more damage and have more reach, there are very few enemies in the game that actually pose any real threat to you, and more importantly, when you go up against the bosses, they are complete pushovers. And that's when you even encounter a boss at all. Most of the time when you're going through the various mansions, you actually don't end up fighting a boss enemy at the end of it at all. It just ends up being the sphere sitting on a pedestal and you just throw a stake at it, you pick up the item, and then you leave. And even the actual platforming is just not that challenging. It's very basic and the only time it really starts to ramp up any sort of difficulty is from really the BS sort where it just throws in flying enemies that you have basically no way of avoiding, or it throws in situations where you'll fall through the floor into a pool of water and just instantly die. And as for the non-linear style of gameplay, well, it doesn't really add all that much to the game. All it really means is that you can get some of the parts out of order, and that's really it. You can also kind of avoid getting certain items until later on when you get upgraded versions of them anyway. For example, I ended up skipping the first dagger that you have access to and ended up getting the silver knife instead, which is actually just a better version of that anyway. But regardless of whether you're doing things in the quote-unquote proper order, or you're just getting them in whatever order you come across them, you're still going to have to be doing a whole bunch of backtracking, going back and forth between towns, because the only ways you can heal are either by going to one of the churches, or by leveling up where you have certain experience point thresholds that you'll get, where if you keep killing enemies and collecting hearts, then you'll just gradually earn more experience points, and once you hit a certain threshold, then it will reduce all of the experience points you currently have to zero, and level you up, which will give you a bit more health and replenish any health that you were missing. But other than that, there's really not a whole lot going on in Castlevania II Simon's Quest. It's a rather basic form of this sort of non-linear action platformer, and what it does try to do that's different from the original Castlevania mostly just ends up not working out all that well. And to make matters worse, there's no real save system in the game at all. When you put it all together, if you know what you're doing anyway, the game's maybe an hour and a half long, but since there's no real save system in the game, instead opting for a password system that only starts you off with just a bunch of items in your inventory and that's it, it means that you'd have to complete that hour and a half all in one sitting, and that's not necessarily necessarily something you're going to want to do with a game like this. You're going to want to take a break or two from it. Because the game can get very tedious, particularly when you run into the day-night transitions, which I have avoided talking about until now, but I do have to mention, because they are downright obnoxious. Every five minutes of time you're playing the game, it's going to transition from day to night or night to day, and every single time you do that, it's going to display an extremely slow text crawl that says, What a horrible night to have a curse! Or, The morning sun has vanquished the horrible night. And when it transitions over to nighttime, all of the shops are closed, and if you're wandering around a town, then there's going to be zombies that attack you. On top of this, any enemies that you fight at night are actually going to be tougher than their daytime counterparts, so they will take more hits to go down, and they will also do more damage to you. This means that if you're low on health and need to go into a church, or if you really need a certain item from a shop in order to progress, then the best course of action is to find a spot in a town and just stand in that spot for however long it takes to transition over into the daytime. And of course, to make matters worse, the type of ending you get is entirely reliant on how many in-game days it takes you, not based on what you actually do. It's not based on actual completion percentage or just certain choices that you make throughout the game or anything like that. No, it is purely based on how quickly you finish the game. And so your first time through, unless you have a walkthrough, it's almost guaranteed you're not going to get the good ending ending, and you're probably not even necessarily going to get the normal ending. 
And while the ending itself doesn't matter all that much, it's more the fact that the game transitions between day and night so often and so slowly that by the time you do get that ending, it's more or less a slap in the face if you get the bad ending, just because of how annoying that day-night transition system is. And when you look at Castlevania II Simon's Quest in the grand scheme of the entire Castlevania series, the only thing it really serves to do is be kind of a proving ground for whether or not the non-linear gameplay style even functions with Castlevania, and more importantly, it sets up a few slight story references for Harmony of Dissonance. And that's pretty much it. It's the kind of game that impressed people by simply not necessarily being a basic linear platformer back in the day, but when you actually look at it with any real critical eye, it's just not a very good example of that. The NES as a platform just didn't really lend itself all that well to gameplay of this particular style, and it wouldn't be until later on with better technology and, of course, more save capacity and things like that, that this sort of non-linear gameplay style for action platformers would actually Actually end up working. I mean, think about it this way. When people say Metroid, they're usually not referring to the original Metroid or even Metroid 2 The Return of Samus. They're referring to Super Metroid, because that was the first time that gameplay style actually really worked well. And Castlevania is no exception. It didn't work very well in Castlevania 2, and thus the first time people really remember it working well is actually with Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which came out on the PS1 in 1997. And when you discuss old-school Castlevania games that are prior to Symphony of the Night, the ones you're probably going to be talking about are, of course, the original Castlevania, Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse, and most notably, Super Castlevania 4. It's just ridiculously easy to lose Castlevania 2 in the shuffle of all that because, frankly, it's just not a very good game, even for its time. It just ends up being tedious and boring at best, and outright frustrating at worst, and that just ends up lending itself to just not being an enjoyable game at all. And unfortunately, while it is an interesting game as far as the Castlevania series history is concerned, unfortunately, it's just not something I can recommend that anybody go back and play. Thanks for watching.